thank you for your interest in these lectures. Before getting fully immersed in the technical details of writing a numerical code to compute the evolution of multiphase flows, we'll spend a few minutes on why we want to do so, what we want to find, and the history of such computations. Direct numerical simulations, or DNS, of multiphase flows refer to fully resolved numerical simulations of systems that are small enough so that all continuum length and time scales can be fully resolved, but large enough for non-trivial scale interactions to take place. DNS of well-defined multiphase systems are an excellent way to study their behavior and properties. Not only can we examine the dynamics in great detail, but we can also use the data to help develop closer relations for industrial models. My group has pioneered such studies over the last decade and a half, and we have been able to contribute major new insights for a large number of specific multiphase systems. The intent of these lectures is to help you learn the basics. Software is needed for a variety of purposes. In addition to commercial codes intended to solve routine problems and large-scale, somewhat general-purpose research codes that represent close to state-of-the-art and often can be used as black boxes, simple codes that are easily understood and modified are also needed. Such codes can be used to educate students and showing them how numerical algorithms can be implemented, as well as used to test new numerical ideas or extensions to new problems. The key need is for new investigators to get up to speed quickly so they can start addressing cutting-edge problems. Here, a relatively simple method to simulate the unsteady two-dimensional motion of two immiscible fluids separated by a sharp interface is introduced. Multiphase flows are everywhere, and understanding them is important for predicting the behavior of natural and industrial processes. Examples from nature include rain and the mass and heat exchanges between the atmosphere and the ocean, sandstorms, sedimentation, and various aspects of volcanic eruptions. Boiling heat transfer and chemical processing in bubble columns are ubiquitous in power and chemical plants. The combustion of liquid fuel always uh, includes atomization, and sprays are found in painting, coating, cooling, irrigation, and a host of other applications. Multiphase flows are, in particular, important part of many processes that are responsible for the functioning of modern societies, such as power generation, oil extraction, and chemical processes, and there is every indication that they will continue to play a major role as we deal with new challenges and opportunities. We define multiphase flows as two or more distinct phases or components flowing together. Thus, air bubbles and oil drops in water, as well as vapor bubbles in liquids and fuel drops in sprays, are multiphase flows. We could speak of multifluid flows when the fluids involved are distinct materials and reserve the term multiphase flow to one fluid but different phases, but this is usually not done. The presence of two or more chemical species is not sufficient. Air, which is a mixture of several gases, such as oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and others, is generally not considered to be a multiphase flow. Similarly, water containing dissolved sugar, salt, and gases is not multiphase flow. Here, we will not consider miscible fluids, although often, particularly for short time, their evolution is very well described by standard models for multiphase flows. We can classify multiphase flows in a variety of ways. Often, we divide them into gas liquid, gas solid, and three phase flows. This is, however, somewhat incomplete since gas liquid flows, oil drops in water, for example, are often important, and the difference between gas liquid and liquid liquid is simply the ratio of their properties. We shall thus simply distinguish between fluid fluid and fluid solid systems. To make the connection with reality, here are experimental pictures of a few multiphase flows. In the upper left corner, we have cavitating flows where vapor bubbles are formed in the low pressure region of water flowing over an airfoil. Below, we have atomization by a swirl atomizer, and in the middle, several buoyant bubbles are rising in quiet scent liquid. In the top right hand corner, we have a splash formed when a drop falls on a pool of liquid, and in the bottom right hand corner, we show the microstructure in an alloy, just to remind us that not all multiphase systems are composed of fluids. Multiphase flows of the type considered here can be described as unsteady, heterogeneous continuum system composed of different phases or materials separated by a sharp interface whose location changes with time. We focus on systems whose physics is well described by continuum theories, and we are primarily interested in systems with a large range of scales, often several orders of magnitude. My interest is primarily in what is usually referred to as direct numerical simulations, or DNS, of multiphase systems. 
By DNS, we usually refer to fully resolved simulations of equations that are believed to accurately describe a particular physical system for situations that involve a large range of spatial and temporal scales. For a large number of multiphase systems, we are reasonably confident that the dynamics is well described by the Navier-Stokes equations, and if we could solve them accurately, we would have a good description of the systems. In reality, however, simulations of full-scale industrial systems resolving the smallest and the largest scales are impractical. However, we can simulate systems with a range of scales spanning one or two orders, and since there are good reasons to believe that the behavior of the smallest scale is, in some sense, universal, our goal is to use fully resolved numerical simulations to help us understand how the large and the small scale motions are coupled and to develop closer models that represent the effect of the smallest scale on the large scale. In simulations of industrial systems, the models account for the smallest scales, thus alleviating the need to resolve them. For the purpose of our discussion, we define direct numerical simulations as fully resolved and verified simulations of a validated system of equations that include non-trivial length and time scales. Here, verified means that we believe that the numerical results are accurate solutions of the equations, and validated means that the equations describe the physics that we are interested in. DNS provides us with full details of the flow in both space and time, and allow us to compute any derived quantity. We are able to turn the various physical processes on and off at will to determine their effect, and we can precisely define the initial conditions for each case and determine how they influence the solution. It is important to note that the purpose of DNS is to help us understand the system and gather data, not just to reproduce experiments. DNS has been used to examine a large number of problems, and here I show a few examples from our own work. Our studies include various aspects of boiling, both away from walls and nucleate boiling, the effect of flow and dendritic solidification, how electric fields change the distribution of drops in channels, formation of drops in atomization, thermocapillary migration of bubbles and drops due to temperature-dependent surface tension, shock propagation in fluids with cavitation bubbles, and the Rayleigh-Taylor instability where a heavy fluid falls into a lighter one. We have examined drag reduction in turbulent flow due to the presence of bubbles and shown that the bubble deformability is critical. And most recently, we have been examining the dynamics of large bubbly systems where bubbles of many sizes rise in a turbulent channel flow. And additional examples of studies of different systems can be found in papers both by us and other authors. Before we go further, I have an important disclaimer. These lectures do not really deal with what we usually call direct numerical simulations, where we examine unsteady flows with a large range of temporal and spatial scales. In these lectures, I only introduce the basic methodology that makes DNS possible, but the problems that we consider and the code that we develop are only suitable for much simpler problems where the range of scale is modest. Furthermore, the code is designed for two-dimensional flows only. Thus, while we can do fully resolved simulations of simple problems, those are not really DNS as defined earlier. However, without knowing the material presented here, it is difficult to write, or even use, I would argue, code suitable for large-scale three-dimensional problems or code suitable for massively parallel computers. Before we embark on a large computational study, it's good to have some idea about what we are looking for. For bubbly flows, we are interested in how the void fraction and the bubble size and shape affect the average rise velocity and how they disperse as they rise. Also, do the bubbles form clusters or microstructures of specific shapes, and how do such structures affect the rise velocity and dispersion? Furthermore, does the bubble size distribution change due to coalescence, breakup, or size-dependent migration, and how do bubbles interact with walls and boundaries? For atomization of liquid jet, we want to know the size and velocities of the resulting drops and how their sizes and velocities are distributed how these quantities depend on the nozzle shape and the flow condition, and how long it takes for the jet to break up. What are the basic mechanisms that control the initial breakup and the drop formation, and how do they depend on turbulence in the jet and the airflow? DNS gives us the complete flow field at every instant in time and space, and we can therefore compute any average or statistical quantity that we desire. Often we are interested in the volume fraction of each phase and averages of various quantities within each phase. To compute those, we define an indicator function that is unity in the phase that we are focusing on. The volume fraction is then an integral over the indicator function divided by the total volume, as shown in the slide, but could also be an average over area or time if that is what we are interested in. A 
Basic average of some quantity f is simply defined as the integral over f multiplied by the indicator function, so the contribution from the other phases is zero, divided by the volume occupied on that fluid, which is the total volume times the void fraction. Many other averages and statistical quantities can obviously be computed from the data. Computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, in the sense of solving the multidimensional Euler and Navier-Stokes equations, has its origin at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the late 50s and early 60s. An interest in computing the evolution of multiphase systems were theirs, was there from the very beginning. Indeed, some of the first published papers on computational fluid dynamics dealt with multiphase flows. The marker and cell method, MAC, method was designed specifically for free surface and multiphase flows and used to simulate interface instabilities, gravity currents, waves, droplet collisions with walls and liquid pools, and other problems. The MAC method was followed by the volume of fluid, or VOF, method, but although both methods produced impressive solution, they were relatively inaccurate. In the late 80s and early 90s, the development of other approaches, such as level sets and front tracking methods, as well as improved volume of fluid methods, marks the beginning of accurate and robust simulation of a variety of multiphase flows. The problems that the Los Alamos group choose to test their methods on have now become classics, and we still see authors use the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, where a heavy fluid falls down into a lighter one, or the broken dam problem, where a heavy fluid initially in one end of the computational domain splashes onto the rest of the domain to test their methods. The MAC method was built on a rather unusual grid, where each variable had its own control volume. This grid structure has proven to be exceedingly robust, and we will use it in the code developed here. Let me end this first lecture by telling you what we will do, assuming you hang in there with me. We developed a relatively simple method to simulate the unsteady two-dimensional flow of two immiscible fluids separated by a sharp interface. The flow solver is an explicit projection finite volume method, third order in time and second order in space, and the interface motion is computed using a front tracking method where connected marker points that move with the flow identify the interface. The method is described in detail and a numerical code is developed using a step-by-step -step approach where we start with a simple but not very accurate code and gradually make it more complete and more accurate. The code is written in MATLAB, but the information presented here should allow an implementation in any other programming language. Here we assume two-dimensional flow, but most of the discussions carries over to fully three-dimensional flows in a straightforward way. This is, in particular, true for the flow solver. It is generally easier to develop a code for a specific problem than a general purpose one, and here we will, at least initially, focus on writing a code to follow the motion of a drop that falls towards a wall. I've grouped these presentations into several lectures of varying length to hopefully help make it clear what I'm talking about. The first lecture is the present one, consisting of introductory material. In the second lecture, I introdu introduce the governing equations and the so-called one-fluid formulation, where we treat the whole flow field using one set of governing equations, irrespectively of which fluid we are dealing with. The third lecture consists of three videos and focuses on how to write a code to solve the governing fluid equations, assuming that adjecting the material field to identify the different materials has been taken care of. It has not at this stage, and in the fourth lecture we discuss some of the main approaches to adject the marker. In lecture 5, we examine one way, front tracking, in detail and write a code for that. We finish up various odds and ends in lecture 6, producing a complete code for the simulations of drop falling into a wall. In lecture 7, we test the accuracy of the code and modify it slightly to examine other related problems. Finally, in lecture 8, we discuss a few additional aspects, including stretch grid, periodic boundaries, and multiple interfaces. Eventually, I may add more topics, but these covered here should provide a reasonable introduction. These lectures are not intended to be a comprehensive introduction to computations of multiphase flows. There are several excellent books available that cover various aspects, but I hope you will bear with me that I list here those that I'm most familiar with. The first give a broad introduction to numerical simulations, but the second is more focused on the topics covered here.